It's okay. It is what it is.
Okay, folks. Um, I am going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today, I've got some on the slide machine. Um, then what I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and pass back your uh, exams. I noticed most of you did figure out that you got to grab a bunch of stuff. Uh, if you have not grabbed stuff, um, when you come up to get your exam, please make sure you do that. Uh, on the exam, there was one perfect score, seven additional A's, there were 16 B's, five C's, four D's, and there were 11 F's plus two people that did not take the exam. So that just gives you an idea of the how it was uh, broken down. So Reagan Barrier, Ashlyn Bell, Aiden Bird, And since Luna Bear is here, try to remember to come up by way of the hall the, uh, stairs. Kinsey Blanchard. Emma Brown. Jair Canales. Katherine Carter, Christina Charles, Bridging Freeman, China Cross, Conlon Doss. Peyton Eman, Alec Fields, Karis Flood, Flood, David Ginger. Or excuse me, Caitlin Hansen, Layla Harden, Lily Hood, Zoe Hubs. Landon Humphrey, Regina Johnson, Kylie Jones, Cameron Joyner. Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you on the sign in sheet. Who has the sign in sheet? Okay. Um, if you will be, before you pass it on, if you plan to come tonight to the cheese talk, which will be in here, that uh, I need you to put a star by your name. It's from seven to eight, and it's going to be in here. It's, I mean, yes, it's online, but it's also going to be in here because there's a cheese tasting to go with it. And if you plan to come to the cheese talk, put a star by your name so that I can buy the right amount of cheese. If we want to do it virtually, that's fine. Yes, it's just you won't get to participate in any of the fun stuff. Uh, Joe DeKerr, Kinley Keith. Awesome. 
Rachel King. Wesley, Lonius, on my Martin Martin. Kyle Payne. Kennedy Pilkington. Tyler Penny. Abby Rains. Tyler Reed. Alexis Reedy. Sophia. Ty Ring. Alejandro Sanchez. Logan Sanders. Brooks Medley. Kinsley Sotos. Rin Tang. Amelia Young. If you came in late and didn't get your test, come see me. Okay, um, if, first of all, I want to remind people that I dropped one exam. Maybe this is your worst exam. Maybe you have two poor exams so far. Even if you have two poor exams so far, it doesn't mean you're out of the game. But what it does mean is that something's got to change. I can already tell you that the next exam is going to be pretty much everything will be right or it will be wrong with very few exceptions. Because on this next exam, you're going to have naming of compounds, writing the formula of compounds, developing Lewis structures for compounds, determining shapes of molecules, and so on and so forth. And there's just only, I mean, there's just no partial credit to be given because those things, they are either right or they are wrong. There is nothing that can be done outside of it. So I am saying that because all the sheets that you picked up are going to be play a very important role in naming um, for ionic compounds. And one of the sheets also has a um, has a, a quick look for the both ionic and covalent. 
I also have another set of sheets that I did not print that I can put online if you want, which is a flow chart of questions you can ask yourself to figure out how to do the naming. But I'll be going over that stuff. I will post these sheets on Blackboard along with if you uh, looked, you have a ton of Quizlets that I posted yesterday. One of those Quizlets has 107 cards. It's all about the ions. One of those Quizlets has the 10 cards about alkanes. One of those Quizlets has some cards about various things, in other words. Um, the Quizlets are not They're not everything, meaning other than like alkanes, which there's only 10 of to begin with. I would, I'm not able to come up with every possible combination on some things. So they're not the end all the be all, but they will give you a lot of practice so that instead of having to make your own flashcards, unless that's how you work best, you will have it at your at the touch of a hand for the most part on any electronic device. You can do it in the 10 minutes that you have in between classes, or if you have a break, you'll have access to it without having to carry a ton of cards around. So again, I'll be posting all of this along with that. Um, and the two uh, PowerPoints, which are flowcharts that help you with naming because it's a lot and I would not I would not wait until the week of the test to start studying this stuff is I guess what I'm trying to get at with all of this I would go ahead and start prepping for it and that way you're not overwhelmed the week of the test trying to get all this information in because I can almost guarantee it won't have to Any questions? I will post the uh, blank copy of the test and the answer key, just like I did for exam one. Uh, you may be wondering why I post the blanks. I post the blanks because each of my exams are thorough and there's a reason for that. that that'll make a fairly good jumping off point to start studying for the final exam. And so I make every exam very thorough in between. And so I post the blank exams and their answer keys um, so that you can not only see what you missed, but also just have that resource later on. Questions about anything I've said? If you have got a one or two exams that you've really bobbled on, I really suggest you come talk to me. Let's figure out how you're studying and see if we can't come up with a better way. Because now that we're halfway through the semester, another thing I wanted to mention, and I can mention it to everybody, is how your brain works when it comes to information. I know a lot of people, and I, I mean, I watched a lot of students when I lived in the residence halls. I know a lot of people will wait until a night or two before the exams to study. And if you do that, your brain doesn't have time to process because it, the way your brain works is it takes in information, but you literally have to rest for that information to form new pathways in your brain. And then you have to do it again, and, or when you go over it again, then it's gonna strengthen that pathway in your brain when you rest. So if you don't rest, you're not gonna be creating the pathway and you're not gonna be strengthening the pathway. 
So it is important that you study a little bit all the time. And that's one reason we have the homeworks the way I do is to have you study a little bit all the time. But still, it's important when you get down to studying for the test to approach it from a different perspective. Any questions for me? Okay, if not, we're going to take our elements that we have been discussing. And today starts the uh, process of combining these elements to form compounds. The one type of compound that we are gonna form is that of an ionic compound, ionic compounds. contain ionic bonds. Where an ionic bond is an electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic being also the same thing as magnetic attraction. between a cation and an anion. A cation results from the loss of electrons to make a positively charged ion. Folks, this is going to require it to be a metal or as we'll talk about the polyatomic ions, ammonium. An anion results from the gain of electrons to make a negatively charged particle or charged ion. These are going to be your um, non-metals, metalloids, and as we'll talk about, your polyatomic anions. Now, one thing you need to know about the formula of ion, our ionic compounds, and that is they're always in the uh, lowest whole number ratio possible. when we start making the formulas. Now, this differs from covalent compounds, which contain covalent bonds. Covalent bonds result from the sharing of electrons. Between two atomic nuclei.
the elements involved in covalent compounds will be your nonmetals and metalloids only. But when they are part of a covalent compound, they are not charged ions. Whoa. Unlike um, ionic compounds, covalent compounds do not have to be in a sm the smallest whole number ratio. The last type of compound we will discuss is going to be that of acids. And we will be using the Arrhenius and Bronsted-Lowry definition for this purpose. In that they are going to be proton or in other words, H plus donors. And we'll talk more about each one of these categories here in a few. Okay. So now you can use one of your periodic tables and if you have, you can either use different lines or if you have highlighters, it's a great time to pull out the highlighters or colors to be able to uh, work with the periodic table. Okay, so group one and two and silver, cadmium, zinc, and aluminum, gallium, and indium. These metals are found in ionic compounds. They always form cations of the same charge.
Group three. On. Oops. Oh, yeah, I had it right to begin with. Sorry, that new row is driving me crazy. I haven't quite gotten the hang of it. These metals are found. in ionic compounds but they can form cations of different charges and I'll explain more but I'm just trying to get the I'm hoping by color coding things, it'll make life easier on you. Now the next batch, I'm only gonna do half of the square at a time. So I'm forewarning you. So it's gonna look funky. But The green are your non-metals and metalloids. Can be found in ionic compounds. When they are, they form anions of the same charge.
Now the purple, they are again, non-metals and metalloids. Which in this case can be found in covalent compounds or molecules. They do, uh, when in covalent molecules, they have no charge. So again, this is just trying to help you visually see what type of compounds an element can form, whether they always form a cation or an anion or no charge. What, what's going on? And you will notice that there are some that are blank. Those, uh, first of all, the, I guess I should, if I'm going to do this properly, these guys would also form cations, but they don't always form the same charge. But the other elements I intentionally left blank. Oh, and I need to include hydrogen in all this stuff. The other elements I intentionally included blank because those are your not your um, noble gases and they don't form compounds. But all the other elements potentially could, and I don't know about TS. Yes. Those can actually form compounds but they're gonna form covalent molecules if they do. And we'll discuss more about why as we get into Lewis structures and stuff of that nature. Does the coloring help some in helping you identify things? Because if you can picture that color, it'll help you maybe figure out what to do. So, the first couple of things you picked up, one of them is a list of all the elements I could come up with in polyatomic ions. You will notice in the top left-hand corner on the front page, um, for truth is in blue, mine is, but basically through cadmium, you will notice that those are the metals I've highlighted in blue up here.
That is because those metals through cadmium always form that same charge. So group one metals always form a plus one charge. Group two metals always form a plus two charge. Silver always forms a plus one charge. Zinc and cadmium always form a plus two charge. And aluminum, gallium, gallium and indium always form a plus three charge. So again, the metals I've highlighted in blue, they always form the same charge. So if it is an ion by itself, that is why we simply have to say, hey, I got the ion form. So you'll notice I call it sodium ion or potassium ion. That is so that I'm distinguishing it from plain old sodium. So if I just say sodium by itself, I'm talking sodium metal, no charge. If I say sodium ion by itself, I'm talking sodium plus one. So it's how, again, I'm only talking if I'm talking about the element by itself. If I'm talking about silver by its sweet little lonesome, then it's silver. But if I'm talking about Ag plus, I'm going to say, hey, I got silver iron, just so that you know it's in iron form. Now, all the ones in red come up next. And obviously I didn't give you an exhaustive list of all the ones that come up in red. But if you'll notice all of the ions that are in red have something else associated with them on this list. What do they have associated with them on this list? A Roman numeral. The reason that all of these in red have a Roman numeral is because, as I mentioned, they can form cations of different charges. So I've got to tell you what charge they have. I gotta say, hey, I have iron. But I have iron in a plus two form. So I'd say, I got iron too. Or if I have iron in a plus three form, I'll say I've got iron three. So I have to specify what charge the ones in red actually possess. Now you will notice that there are some highlighted for class purposes. I will always use the one that is highlighted, which is grayed in yours. In other words, I'm going to use iu patent naming, which is what that is, where we say copper one or copper two. However, the metals known to the ancients, they also have generic names that people still recognize. So for instance, if you look at iron, which is the first one I highlighted, that was iron two and iron three, uh, again, in class, I would call it iron two and iron three, but it can also be known as ferrous if it is iron two or ferric if it is iron three. Now, the reason I'm giving you the ferrous and the ferric is because you may encounter those words on um, active. But for class purposes, I'll stick with the IUPAC naming, which means I'll call it iron two and iron three. But just in case you see it on active, you have it there as ferrous and ferric also. Now, all the ones are highlighted in green are elements that can form anions. So starting at about the bottom, uh, one half on the right-hand side of the first page, you will find those ions in green. And you may want to highlight it whatever color you used in your, uh, all of this stuff in whatever color you used on the periodic table so that they're 
that color is becoming part of who you are. <laughs> These nonmetals and metalloids always have the same charge when they're part of an ionic compound. If it's a nonmetal or metalloid in group 15, it's always going to have a minus three charge if it's by itself in a compound. If it is a group 16 nonmetal, it's always going to be a minus two charge if it's in an ionic compound. And group 17 is always going to be the minus one charge if it's in an ionic compound. So these are just telling you what their charges are. Now, the, the neat thing about anions, again, they always have that charge. Because of that fact, it's going to help us when we start going from formula to names, it's going to help us predict what the metals who have varying charges can have, what charge they have. Because again, non metals, that's the only charge they will form when they're by themselves. The second sheet you picked up is a periodic table that lists the metals and non-metals metalloids and their charges. So it looks like this one, where you have a full periodic table. These are the ones that are always the same charge. So group one is always a plus one, group two is always a plus two. Your group 15 nonmetals is always a minus three. Your group 16 nonmetals is always a minus two. Your group 17 nonmetals is a minus one. Now, silver, cadmium, zinc, aluminum, gallium, and indium. I've always been asked how do you memorize those? First of all, to me, they look like a set of stairs. In the middle of the periodic table, it looks like I got a set of stairs. In the first step of the set of stairs, there is just one element, and that is silver. Notice silver has a plus one. In the second step of the stairs, you've got zinc and cadmium. That's two elements. They're both a plus two. And in the third step, you have three elements, aluminum, gallium, and indium. And they're all plus three. So in other words, if you can remember the stairs, starting with silver, the number of elements in that step also helps you to remember the charge on that element. Because folks, you're not going to have all these sheets of paper on a test. You've got to have them all memorized. So I'm tr also trying to help you memorize. Questions. So. Yes. So far, all I'm doing is talking about ionic compounds. So really, this purple isn't fitting in yet. I'm only gonna I'm only gonna talk about get through the blue, red, and green today. So, <clears throat> what charge would chromium have? Plus two, why? It's a group two. What charge would cadmium have? Plus two, why? It's in the second step of the staircase. What charge would selenium have? I've heard multiple things, a plus, a minus three, a minus two, what is it? Minus two, why? 
Group 16, non-metal. Metal moid. Well, that is non-metal. What charge would tungsten have? You don't know. So what are you going to have to include with tungsten when you name it? A Roman numeral. That's why knowing the periodic table design should help you. Because a lot of this stuff is embedded in it. Okay, questions? Well, let's talk about the polyatomic. There is around. The polyatomic ions begin on uh, the very last one on the front page and covers all of the back page just for the anions. And that doesn't include the two cation polyatomic ions that I make you memorize, which are hydronium and ammonium. So again, you got hydronium ammonium on the front page. You got borate on the front page. And then you got the entire back page. That is a lock. So I cannot by any shape, form, or fashion. <coughs> give you something to help you memorize all of the polyatomics. Some of them you're just going to have to learn. You're just going to have to learn them. But I can give you trends to help you memorize a portion of them. And that is what the third document was. Which is a half a periodic table. These are things that you can use to help you memorize all the ones that are listed. And that's a, a huge chunk. And technically a few that aren't listed. So I'm giving you some trends in the left hand on the left hand side to help you memorize them. So if you look at period two. So across. And you look at boron, carbon, and nitrogen that end in A, T, E. What trends do you notice? Look at the boron, carbon, and nitrogen. Don't worry about oxygen. Just boron, carbon, and nitrogens that end in A, T, E. They all have three oxygens. What else do you notice? They're all negative charges. It decreases from three to two to one. So folks, do you think I memorized carbonate? No. I mean, yes, probably when I was in your shoes I did because I didn't figure this out until about five years ago. And I wish I'd have figured it out when I was a student because it would have helped me a lot. But now, would I have memorized carbonate knowing this? No. I would have memorized boring. Because I would have known, oh, let's see, borate has three oxygens and it's minus three charge. So to go to carbonate, it's still going to have three oxygens, but I'm going to make it a minus two charge. To go to uh, nitrate, 
it's still going to have three oxygens, but I'm going to make it a minus one charge. So I'm simply going to memorize one and know, oh, they all have three oxygens, but it goes three, two, one in charge. It's a lot easier to memorize one than it is to memorize three of them. Um, now, I want you to look at the ion, which is the anion of an element. So, uh, looking over at period three. <laughs> Look at period three. First thing, if it ends in I D E, what type of anion is it? If it ends in I D E, what type of anion is it? It's an anion of the element. Oh, so in other words, with few exceptions, with three exceptions, folks, there are only three exceptions to this rule that I'm about to tell you. If it ends in IDE, it's an anion of an element. There are three exceptions cyanide. Hydroxide and peroxide. But otherwise, if it ends in IDE, it is an anion of an element. Cyanide, hydroxide, and peroxide. Two of which I have listed with oxygen up here. Otherwise, if it ends at IDE, it is an anion of an element. Now, I want you to look at period three and tell me what you notice about phosphorus. All the phosphorus ones. They're all three minus. Wait a second. So you know, it, so if I memorize the charge for phosphide, phosphide, the element anion, which I just gave you, would always be because brick fifteen is always a minus three. If I know brick fifteen is a minus three, that means I know the charge on the polyatomics for phosphorus. Do it. What about sulfur? Does that rule hold? Yeah. If I know sulfur is a minus two, the polyatomics for sulfur are a minus two as well. What about tellurium? Something you don't play with much. Does it still follow the rule? Yeah. So in other words, everything from period three down, period two is the oddball. Everything from period three down, if you know the charge of the anion of the element, you know the charge on the polyatomic ion. So do you think I would memorize phosphate charge? No, I've memorized all sides chart and just know that it's always the same. Now, what do you notice about phosphate, sulfate, tellurate? 
Selenate, selenate. What do you notice about the eights of all those? They all have four oxygens. The biggest polyatomic ion, the biggest polyatomic ion for period three down gets four oxygens. The eight get four oxygens. What do you notice about the I, the I-T-E? They all have three oxygens. Group 15 and group 16 are known as a family of two, meaning that you go from the eight to the I and you drop one oxygen. Looks like I dropped that. from the A to the I, you just drop an oxygen. Now, family, or group 17 is known as a family of four. Oh, before I go on to group 17, do you think with the things I just told you that I memorized selenite, selenite, tellurite, tellurite, um, arsenate, arsenite, no. I memorize how to deal with phosphorus, I memorize how to deal with sulfur. Because I know everybody in their family is going to behave the same way. In other words, you don't have to memorize arsenate and arsenite and silinate and silinite and chlorate and chlorite. Just kind of no phosphorus and sulfur. And as long as it's in the same family, it's going to behave the same way. Family of four is group 17. What do you notice about the family of four? First of all, what charge do they have? Negative one, who else has that charge? The anion of the element. So again, it's the same charge as the anion of the element. Now, what do you notice about the family of four? Look at ClO4 minus BrO4 minus IO4 minus, what do you notice? They're the same. The only difference is what the main element is. So do you think I memorized bromine and iodine or chlorine? No, I just memorized the chlorine group and know that because they're in the same period or the same group, they're going to be exactly the same. That cuts down. If you know that, folks, you cut down five, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 elements by simply knowing. Phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, you cut down 16 polyatomic ions because they're going to be the exact same as long as they're in the same group. That's a lot of information you cut. 16 uh, polyatomic. But I can give you some more. I can cut out even more memorization. By understanding trends. So, 
we have sulfate. If hydrogen has a charge, what would it be? I think I heard it. Not certain though. Hydrogen had a charge, what would it be? A plus one, typically. Now hydrogen can actually have a minus one too, but uh, typically it's a plus one. So when I combine these two, HSO4, I also take and combine the charges, minus two plus one is equal to a minus one. So in other words, hydrogen sulfate it has a, or HSO4 has a minus one charge. And because I am adding hydrogen to the sulfate, I add the word hydrogen to the sulfate. Let's talk about phosphite. If I add one hydrogen to phosphite, I get HPO3. What's the charge going to be? A negative two because minus three plus one equals a negative two. And because I added hydrogen to phosphate, I add the name hydrogen to the phosphite I meant. Now phosphite, my other, another option is I can add uh, two hydrogens to it. And I get H2PO3. And what's the charge going to be? A negative one, because a plus, um, a plus one plus one minus three comes out equal to a negative one. Now I got to tell you, I added two hydrogens. Well, the prefix for two is di. So it's dihydrogen. Phosphite. If you understand that hydrogen carries a plus one and can add the charges together, if you understand that you got to tell me you added a hydrogen to it, that eliminates memorizing. Seven, 14, 14. 14 more polyatomic ions. So now we're 30 polyatomic ions that you don't have to memorize if you just understand the trend. When you start thinking about it that way, that adds up quick. Now there's just some I can't help you memorize, like acetate. You just gotta know what acetate is. Hydroxide, you just gotta know what hydroxide is. So let's look at the long list. Second page, well, let's start with the first page actually. Right hand side, right at the halfway mark. And you may wanna highlight these that I cannot help you memorize. 
with trends. I can't help you memorize ammonium or hydronium. You just gotta do, you just gotta do the memorization thing. Technically, I told you that borate starts the story for carbonate and nitrate. So you might have to memorize borate. On page two, HCO3 minus technically could follow the IUPAC naming that I just gave you, but it has a name that everybody knows. So you're gonna have to learn this one and that is bicarbonate. So you stuck, you're stuck memorizing HCO3 minus as bicarbonate. You're stuck memorizing oxalate. You're stuck memorizing acetate, and I don't care which version you memorize. I highlighted the one that I'm going to use all the time. But I don't care which one you memorize. You're stuck memorizing cyanide and cyanate and carbide. You can use the trends I gave you for nitrate and nitrite, but you can't use the trend I gave you for azide. So you're stuck memorizing azide. You're stuck memorizing silicate or um, peroxide and hydroxide. And you're stuck memorizing silicate. At the very, very bottom for sulfur, you're stuck memorizing thiocyanate, thiosulfate, and disulfide. The bottom three, you're just stuck with it. The only other four I didn't talk about is permanganate, chromate, dichromate, and molybdate. However, chromate and molybdate follow the same trend as sulfate and phosphate and arsenate and selenate. So you really don't have to memorize those because they follow the same trend, leaving you stuck memorizing permanganate and dichromate. You might have to memorize chromate. I mean, you might have to memorize that chromate, dichromate and molybdate all have a minus two charge because I didn't give you any ruling about that. But in general, they follow the same general formula that sulfate and selenate do. So I didn't cut out all the memory work, but I did cut down some of it. If you know the trends. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing on Thursday is we're going to start making formulas of compounds. <coughs> And tonight's homework is just going to be some active on naming uh, polyatomic ions, I believe it is. Names and formulas of polyatomics. But we will start naming ionic compounds and covalent molecules on Thursday. Yes. Oh, I was asked for the test. Am I sticking to these or do you need to learn? <coughs> First of all, all the polyatomics are on here. I would learn the periodic table from how to name 
not memorize these names for all the medals. So no, for the medals, I'm not just sticking to this list, but I will, uh, we're, uh, again, that's what this part up here, blue and red was about, is learning how to do it rather than <coughs> pure memory work. <laughs> okay, I will see you on Thursday. And we will be in, I will tell you which room we'll be in for lab lecture. I think it's 105, but I got to double check. But I will see you Thursday.